Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Many people will say, well, I don't want to hear about that. That's too terrible to think about even. Or other people will say, well, I can't grasp that. The mind can't get hold of it. The figures are too high. This destructive capability is beyond my comprehension. And so I think that maybe that's uh, what we have to deal with first of all here is this problem of just not being even wanting to talk about nuclear warfare, not facing the disastrous consequences of it. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Dr. Peter Kalber, Associate Professor of Management Information Systems at Bowling Green State University. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of facing the nuclear threat. Here's Father Basic. Pete, I'm glad that we have the chance to talk uh, seriously now. Uh, you and I have done this in the past, even though we come from very different backgrounds and traditions, we seem to have a certain kinship of spirit. And over the years that I've been at Bowling Green, we've had the opportunity to talk seriously at times, and I always have enjoyed that, and I would uh, like to carry on a, a bit here on this program. Sounds good to me. Okay, um, and I would like to um, move in the direction of talking about peace and war, and perhaps especially the, the nuclear threat that we uh, live under these days. And so I guess uh, as we begin to talk about the question of war in any kind of moral perspective, one of the things we see is that the development of nuclear weapons has really changed the situation drastically. We seem to live in a totally new kind of environment in terms of war. So one could begin to detail that, I suppose, in terms of the terrible destruction that is now possible uh, and so on. But as we begin to talk like that, what happens, it seems, is that the mind recoils from that. So that many people will say, well, I don't want to hear about that. That's too terrible to think about even. Or other people will say, well, I can't grasp that. The mind can't get hold of it. The figures are too high. This destructive capability is beyond my comprehension. And I think some people will say, well, I get psychically numb. That might not be their phrase, but they'll say, you know, that turns me off, or my mind just blanks out, or I tend to escape when, uh, into some other diversion when I begin thinking like that. And so I think that maybe that's uh, what we have to deal with first of all here is this problem of just not being even wanting to talk about nuclear warfare, not facing the disastrous consequences of it. I know when we were in a discussion group not long ago, I was talking to um, a woman said in the group that she had this dream and she didn't know how to interpret it, but in the light of all the talk of nuclear weapons and so on, she realized that it was a dream about nuclear destruction. The situation she was in meant that she that there, the bomb had been dropped and she was in this horrible kind of uh, situation as a result. So uh, I, that makes me think that perhaps when we do repress talk of this or move the talk of nuclear holocaust into a zone of silence, that something bad happens to us psychically, that perhaps we're walking around with a vague discomfort and are not aware of what might be causing it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's been some some uh, uh, scientific corroboration of that view. Uh, in fact, the official term apparently is leading the double life. Hmm. Uh, those people who attempt to repress all of this and attempt to go about their their everyday lives in some sort of normal fashion uh, apparently have not been able to completely repress this. One of the discoveries is that people have a lot less energy to devote towards uh, the routine activities of their life. In other words, they would like to take their routine activities seriously, but something in them prevents them from doing this. And uh, Robert J. Lifton, who was uh, a very important force in making known the psychological after-effects of the Hiroshima bombing uh, 
has an assistant or had an assistant who did some psychological studies of children. Mm -hmm. And uh, the discovery was, was not very pleasant. Uh, many children uh, uh, do not think that they are going to live their full term of life. Uh, some do not want to have children because they don't wish to bring children into a world such as this, etc., etc. Uh, I think it's fairly clear that as much as some people would like to repress uh, these thoughts, that they are down there and they are having their effect. And uh, the, the tragic thing there, it seems to me, is not just that uh, the one life has an effect on the other, but that by repressing this, it seems to me we're, we're preventing or precluding uh, a very important element from participating in decision-making in, in this country and in this world, and that by not participating, by not dealing with the subject, and by not taking a stand and attempting to convince others or influence others in this regard, it seems, at least many people think, uh, that we're increasing the possibility of the disaster that people are trying to avoid, even, even mentally avoid. Mm -hmm. I think you're right about the young people. I think that I saw results of a survey that said something like over 50% of the young collegiate age uh, people thought that they would eventually die in a nuclear war. 50%? Something over 50%, as I recall it, yes. And uh, so, I mean, that really is in the air. We live under the threat of that bomb. But it is uh, quite remarkable, personally, isn't it, how, how easy it is to sort of, uh, on the surface at least, put that out of one's mind right, right. and not come to grips with it. I think that people have done that for years now. And it's almost like perhaps we don't want to admit that Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened. It's like with a lot of other tragedies in the past. It seems easier to forget them and fail to learn the lessons of those uh, terrible events. Right. Perhaps that ends up being somehow a, a blight in our American history, something that we don't want to make part of our general consciousness, that indeed that, that those terrible bombings occurred. So, all right, so we have to begin now to, to try to respond to this in some way, don't we? This idea that people don't want to look at uh, this whole thing. Perhaps for some people, Pete, it might be just simply a matter of lacking the knowledge just uh, being an factually not understanding what really is going on or what is uh, possible here. I know I read some figures recently that tried to detail about the United States stockpile of weapons and how powerful they were, and they said that they were equivalent to 615,000 times the explosive force of the bomb dropped at Hiroshima. That's what's available in our world. And with that stockpile, we can destroy every major Soviet city 40 times over. Here's an interesting one. The Soviet and U.S. stockpiles together contain the equivalent of 12 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child in the entire Isn't world. Isn't that incredible? Well, it is. I mean, when you think of the destructive power uh, of these weapons, um, just those kinds of facts. I, I guess... What I'm always looking for is, is how do you, do you turn out making this real to oneself? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. what analogies are there to, to really bring this out? I know you and I listened to a tape by Helen Caldicott uh, on one occasion where she was uh, talking about something like this, that within 40 minutes after the first button would be pushed, less than 40 minutes as I recall it, the whole of civilization as we know it would be destroyed. That is, if all of this was unleashed. Right. I heard right. Herman Kahn on a television program not long ago talking about this, the futurologist mm -hmm. and, that mm -hmm. teaches at Harvard and right. so on. And he, he really debunked some of that. You know, he said that, uh, well, that was the least likely uh, scenario, as he put it, that the, the idea that all the buttons would be pushed and all of the weapons would fly. In other words, he thought that, I guess he was moving in the direction of thinking that the more limited nuclear war is what is the more likely possibility. And but yet, if you, if you think about that a little bit, um, think about the, the psyche of the person who is even willing to, to start a limited nuclear war, and then think about the potential for controlling that once it gets off the ground. It's really hard for a lot of people to believe that there's anything reasonably close to controlling 
a war once it goes nuclear. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the is one of the important issues where Khan stands on one side and a lot mm -hmm. of people stand on uh, on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems to think that reason is still going to prevail. The other side seems to think that the unleashing of the first bomb means reason has failed to it's prevail already. already. And so why should you have any confidence uh, that, that reason will be able to control anything from that point? That's well stated, Pete. Yeah, I, I can uh, sort of feel and uh, sense the power of that argument. Uh, you know, that's one thing that comes up in all this talk about nuclear warfare, doesn't it? There is sort of an irrational premise to it. The whole yes. thing is absurd. I mean, it's almost absurd to be sitting here talking about right. the possibility of wiping out the whole of civilization exactly. that's been built up. I mean, just the, the pure uh, thinking about that. You, you hear people sitting on cal calmly talking about, you know, destroying Mega cities deaths. 40 ton yes. times over or uh, having this limited nuclear war where you only wipe out a million people or something. Right. It's, right. it's just uh, something uh, absurd about it from the very beginning. And yet the fact is that's where we are yes. because of the rise of science and technology and the production of the nuclear weaponry. Here we are faced with this actual situation. In fact, sort of an accelerating arms race, I guess, which really bothers a lot of people. Now I know that it seems to be, yes. Yeah, some people claim that that's what's given a lot of impetus to the, the, the peace movement. You know, we have sort of, I think, a strengthened peace movement going these days. And I've read some of the commentators that say, well, it's because leadership is talking about a limited nuclear war. I think or, that's, that's played a, a major part. Yeah, and also the, the whole neutron bomb idea, I know, really set people off. I know a priest who's not paying his taxes uh, on purpose and being public about it and giving the money to the Peace Academy because uh, I think that neutron bomb idea really got to him, that the idea is somehow we're going to destroy people and not things. You know, I don't know if that's really uh, how it works or what it's all about, but in that the popular mind... That is how it's mind, advertised. Yeah, in the popular mind, that's how it comes across. And, and, and it's, it's just inconceivable. You have to wonder uh, what kind of mentality you're dealing with, uh, even when dealing with someone who is perhaps, quote, popularizing, unquote. That is, even, as you say, if the neutron bomb does behave in some slightly more sophisticated way than simply killing people and not destroying structures, to allow it to be popularized again, I I really need to put that in quotes, mm -hmm. uh, and to and to state it or to state to uh, describe its its characteristics in that way makes you wonder: uh, Are we are we talking with sane people at all here? Mm -hmm. I think the point that you made a, a few minutes ago that that people don't have the facts uh, is an important one, and in fact, I think it connects up with the previous point that you made. Uh, namely that people are trying to avoid thinking about the situation. One way to avoid thinking about the situation is to not read anything about the, the, uh, the factual uh, consequences or the factual considerations. It's interesting, too, that uh, a big chunk of the peace movement or anti-nuclear war movement right now is devoted to education. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a, a, quite a contrast with what we saw during the Vietnam War, for example, where people had taken sides, so to speak. That is, they were very partisan, and they were willing to go to, go to almost any length to express that partisanship. Here you've got uh, organizations like Ground Zero, for example, which is devoted to the educational process, which has deliberately stayed away from taking a position. It's almost as if they've realized that if people would simply become aware of the facts you wouldn't have to persuade them of anything. I heard the leader of Ground Zero talk that way, that if we simply can get the information out, let the American people know about the stockpiling of weaponry and what could happen and the great dangers involved and the possibility of the system failing and so on, that people would indeed move in a more pacifist position and uh, would uh, sort of put pressure on government leadership to begin the process of reducing the armaments in the world. So I, and I tend to think that very often we do find solutions to our problems through knowledge. I suppose because you and I are in the academic world, we, we have are a tendency to believe that, yes. that way. Right. We, we end up thinking ideas are important, probably more important than they really are. But I, I do think that in this case and many others that often when people know things, 
indeed they do begin to try to do something about it. I think we saw that in the civil rights movement. Right. I think when right. people began to know the plight of blacks in this country, that a certain percentage at least became more open to trying to redress those grievances. And they were I, willing to act on that knowledge. Yes, yes, and I believe we could see the same thing happening now. And, and perhaps indeed we do see little glimmers of that. I noticed the uh, American Medical Association was on record as encouraging the physicians to be aware of the medical consequences of uh, nuclear war. And I think part of that was to let others know it as well so that they were interested in that educational thing. And I know there's a course going on at Harvard now along that line of education to the results of nuclear war. And these people are beginning to talk about, hey, the only thing that really counts here is prevention. Because exactly. once you begin to talk about what's going to happen, you, you, you just see the total breakdown. I mean, I remember Helen Caldicott, I think she was saying about the, the way the medical services would break down. Now when we've got a disaster, we think, well, the people around there will come to their mm -hmm, aid. Mm -hmm. So we have a tornado goes through, and the people in the neighboring towns help, and you take those people to other hospitals and so on, and eventually you take care of them. But in a nuclear attack, there wouldn't be anything like that. Exactly. All the areas that are targeted are precisely the areas where medical facilities are concentrated, where physicians are concentrated, where nurses are concentrated. There's not going to be anyone to come in and help. Mm -hmm. um, I think people have, have uh, misunderstood what the aftermath of a nuclear war would, would really look like. They, they seem to have old-fashioned... Um, Oh, World War One or World War Two conceptions of what you have after a war like this, and the fact is that the medical facilities are going to be virtually non-existent. And I think mm. that's the point that and there Helen... won't be healthy people walking around to take care exactly, of those other exactly, exactly, exactly. The people who aren't killed outright are going to be themselves probably injured. Uh, there, there really won't, there won't. It's not just that there won't be doctors and nurses. There won't even be, as you say, healthy people to to assist you. I think Hel Helen Caldicott and the Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, have... Who is she? Why don't you just say who she is, and then she, let's yeah. talk more about uh, what she has to say. Okay, she is, if I remember correctly, the president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and she has been very, very active. She cut her teeth, as a matter of fact, on the nuclear question in Australia. Yeah, that's what I thought she And was. And uh, she almost single-handedly organized virtually the whole country to finally put a stop to nuclear testing in the areas of Australia and I think she's had some effect on the mining of uranium in Australia also. Uh, she's written a very influential book called Nuclear Madness, uh, What You Can Do. She's not simply trying to describe the medical consequences although that's mm -hmm. a big part of what she's trying to do. She's also trying to suggest uh, a, a, a a route of action for people who do get concerned and say, well, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's pretty much her background, and she has had a, a very stimulating effect on the Physicians for Social Responsibility. It's a group that has existed for a while, uh, but which had become pretty moribund. And when she took over and made the nuclear war issue the central issue for them, all of a sudden their... Uh, uh, their membership increased dramatically, and their impact, I think, on the American public has been very dramatic because people people tend to take physicians seriously. Uh, it's not some hippie in the street uh, who may or may not know what he or yeah. she is talking about. The assumption is that if you've got uh, uh, thousands of physicians who have who have agreed that, yes, these are the probable consequences of, of a nuclear assault, People tend to say, okay, these people uh, know what they're talking about. They tend to be conservative. Uh, they're, they're not uh, flaky. Uh, we, have to, we have to take them seriously. And I think they've had a very, very uh, powerful impact because of the discipline and of the area that they represent. Mm -hmm. I guess we've got uh, that Union of Concerned Scientists right. that keeps telling us the same thing. Yes. People, Nobel Prize winners yes. in various areas. and. And I think that, uh, speaking out of my own tradition, we have a lot of church leaders these days who have spoken out and given greater witness right. on this and right. are beginning to, to speak more of the fact that in a nuclear age that really the use of weaponry really uh, cannot be countenanced. That, that just simply can't be. 
and that uh, that is ruled out as a moral option. Exactly. So we do have uh, important people coming forward in the society, it seems to me, to bring this to our attention. Pete, can we talk more about, you know, what it is that would happen? I mean, I, in my own mind, when I hear the total destruction of civilization, you know, I, that's, that's about enough for me. You know, you can't grow crops, I guess, you know, because of the radiation uh, that uh, it would be... I just saw something terrible the other day. They were taught, they was they were playing out this scene where the idea would be people would be in shelters and then they were going to send the old people out outside the shelters because their lifespan was very short anyway, and they would go out and forage for food mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, try to mm -hmm. to see what was doing out there on the surface of the earth. Remarkable. I mean, isn't that gruesome? I mean, just to, to read that or to contemplate that. Here we are in a period when we're supposed to be paying more attention to the rights of, of older citizens, and uh, you get a scenario like that. You've got to wonder uh, what's going on. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, Helen Caldicott and, and some of the others have been quite explicit on what the probable consequences are. And interestingly enough, I, I might add this before, before maybe we start talking about some of those consequences. Uh, I participated recently in a, uh, in fact, it was Earth Day, and uh, we set up a table, the Bowling Green Peace Coalition did, to, to um, hand out literature. And one of the responses that I got was that our information is biased. And uh, so we're not really educating people, we're propagandizing. The interesting thing that many people may not realize is that an awful lot of the ground zero information, the Physicians for Social Responsibility information, is taken straight out of government documents. Mm -hmm. This is not someone else's opinion that's simply uh, being manufactured for purposes of propaganda. This information is coming straight out of government documents. Uh, we're simply taking what the government has already found out and allowing other people to to share the knowledge. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Caldicott and others have mentioned is the fact that the whole idea of depending on shelters and, and all of this is anachronistic. Um, one of the most likely consequences of being in a, a civil defense shelter, let's say a, a, a shelter that you've dug yourself in your backyard, is that because of the very intense heat and firestorms which will follow a nuclear attack, the oxygen is depleted. So two things happen to you. Uh, you are roasted to death in your shelter, and at the same time you're asphyxiated because there's no oxygen. Uh, so if you go into your shelter, it's going to be your tomb. Uh, I don't think many people recognize that we're talking about weapons uh, which which simply rule out, in many cases, any of the standard responses. Okay. I think this is this is something that needs to be gotten across, yeah. and these Pre groups are attempting to do yeah, it. To do that. Yeah, perhaps that you put that as maybe as graphically as we need to put it. I mean, the, the destruction is immense and mind-boggling. But I think what we've got to get back to is that we do have to look at that. Right. You know, we humans have learned to, to look at death. Death is something that we don't like, and the death of our loved ones is horrifying to us and so on. But we do learn to do that. We learn to come to grips with it. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has helped to teach our whole culture that we have to face up to death and to pre-vision it for our loved ones and to get to the point where we're able to say, I will die someday. And many uh, of us have moved in a, a healthy direction there. I think we have made improvement in our society. I really do. And I think that uh, we need to be able to do that same thing with this mass destruction. It's a matter right. of trying to wrap your mind around right. a bigger fact of right. uh, multiplying the deaths that might occur. So I believe that, that that's an essential element in it, that it really is possible to do. I mean, one can begin to think about it. One can't see the whole of the picture and uh, the mass destruction is so large that we don't have any real analogies for it but if we learn to face death as it is in a smaller level that uh, we can extrapolate to some degree in other words i think we can make progress on that we yeah. have to make progress yeah. on that. we don't just have to be psychically numbed we can begin to look at it and i have to get in here p2 my own uh sense of the Christian outlook on this, because our, our Christian idea is that all the evils in the world can be faced, because the power of good is always greater than the power of evil. 
that that's our fundamental belief in a God who wishes good for human beings, who's on our side in the struggle in life, and that the whole message of Jesus Christ is that he casts out the powers of demons, he, he takes on death, the worst of evils, and he conquers that. That's what we mean by the resurrection of Jesus, a vindication of this power of God, a validation of a message that says you can trust life. So with that kind of background, I think that ought to help us in some way to be able to face this larger issues. Now, people coming from other traditions are going to have to find their own way to mm-hmm. do that, mm-hmm. and I know some have. But I'm just telling you that out of our Christian heritage, we are the ones who say you've got to be realistic. Sin for us, in one sense, is to f- fail to face reality, to turn our face away from what life is really all about, to fail to accept the human situation as it is. And uh, I think our faith is constantly calling upon us to immerse ourselves in the real and look at life as it is and face the evils head on because they can be mastered. That's what we say. Sounds you want to like, make a brief comment on that? Yeah, Pete? it sounds like have we, we have a, a, a massive function for the church to, to perform here then. Yes. It seems as if it's, it's uh, admirably suited to give us a perspective from which we can start to wrap our minds around the problem mm-hmm. that we must we must face this problem. And good. And in, in other words, as an outsider to the church tradition and so on, you can see a potential ally in the church. Definitely. I mean, you can see no in the Christian message a strength to help you in your own efforts Definitely. to be a peacemaker. Definitely. I, I, I like that, and I'm hoping that more and more people will come to think that way. You know, there's a certain segment of the society that wants to rule out all that religion stuff and faith stuff and church stuff as being nothing but an opiate and uh, mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. that keeps us from facing social mm-hmm. concerns. And I'm always fighting the position, no, the resources are there. Jesus taught us important things about peacemaking in the world and that really uh, and has given us energy and strength to do that. And I want to call on that, and I want to form coalitions with people like you to try to work on this whole question of establishing peace in our world. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. 